Okay, so I've often said that if I wrote a book, um, I would call it Back to Our Beginnings, because although inevitably our genetic makeup has an enormous amount to do with who we are, also our beginnings, our experiences, particularly in our formative years, that have a significant impact on us. Inevitably, we have different beginnings, and some of us have more favourable beginnings than others, but you don't have to look very far to find amazing inspirational stories about people who've risen um, above adversity and done remarkable things. I think having been in education for all these years has meant that I am very interested in how we respond and react to the various beginnings and experiences that we have. And most pertinently, um, in terms of schools, how we best provide an environment which enables our young people to find out who they are, to become who they want to become, and to go on to lead happy and successful lives. Because surely that's what schools should be doing. So imagine being a hungry rat in the middle, sorry about that, uh, in the middle, uh, put into an, uh, an unknown cage with food in the centre of it. So research tells us that if baby rats are licked and groomed extensively by their, uh, by their mothers, uh, that they become more curious, more confident, more capable, and will more quickly leave the security of the edge and move to the centre of the cage and find the food. Interestingly, we're also told that they're less, uh, less susceptible to illness in later life. Well, research also shows that the same thing is true for humans, not the licking bit, uh, but uh, that those of us who have had very close relationships with our parents and good parental bonds um, also uh, go on to be, on the whole, more curious, more confident, more capable, and are also our probability of a healthy life is also increased. Those uh, children who unfortunately have to live through abusive situations, it's been uh, shown that, and perhaps it's not surprising, I don't know, that uh, if they had very close relationships with their mothers, whether a natural mother or an adoptive mother, that they were, their life chances increased and they were more likely to weather those poor conditions. So um, our beginnings are obviously very significant to us. Many years ago, my husband David and I ran a church youth group. It started off a very civilised manner with the children of uh, church families and all was going very well until suddenly the numbers coming into our home every week doubled because a group of youth, uh, mostly young lads I think, started to come from a training institution which picked up on young people who were beginning to get into trouble with police and they tried to give them a trade and set them off on a, on a better footing in life. I particularly remember one lad who was 19 and had been in 17 different foster homes in his life. And I remember another lad, a big burly lad, who used to get into fights in our small kitchen, that was quite interesting. Uh, and uh, we found out that he was going to have his 18th birthday the next week, so I made a cake. Now anyone that knows me will know that that is not on my skill list. And my children used to beg for daddy to make cakes in our house. Uh, but I made this cake, it certainly didn't look like this one on the screen, uh, but that's the best I can do. And we put hands on it and we sang happy birthday to him. And this big burly lad cried because he had never had a birthday cake and people singing happy birthday to him. And it was such an interesting time to see how they so wanted these young people, they so wanted to get their lives onto a good footing, and yet it was so hard for them. Um, and what, what I particularly noticed was their resilience was really shaky. So they'd be going on fine, and then an inevitable bump in the road would happen, and it was really, really hard for them to weather um, setbacks. So um, curiosity and confidence, like the rats moving into the centre of the cage, and resilience, the ability to weather setbacks, and all these other things that you can see there, confidence, courage, determination, grit, and all these other attributes, managing your own emotions, uh, and so on and so forth. We've come to realise that these attributes are extremely uh, important for happiness and success in life, and indeed we've spent quite a bit of time here at school trying to encourage our students to develop them and nurture them, uh, realising that there is so much more to education and schools than simply worrying about what exam results they're going to get. And, um, I, this time last week, I was at the think tank uh, listening to Michael Gove and uh, Tristram Hunt talking about what they were going to put into the 2013, uh, 2015 sorry, education agenda. 
Um, and I was really delighted to hear that both of them mentioned these things. And it seems that we've really moved on from uh, the whole thing of focusing on exams all the time and how people do and, and um, an intense pressure to be excellent every moment of the time. Thank goodness for that, that the education system in this country is beginning to realise across all schools that actually there is so much more that we need to be delivering to our young people if we want them to have the best chance to cope with whatever beginnings they've had and whatever their lifelong story as they go through to find out who they are and become who they want to become. We really need to support them and nurture them in all of these things as well. There is such a risk when we focus on exams that people feel that they have to be just brilliant at everything all of the time. And then you've got, that right at the extreme end of that, you fall into this obsessive perfectionism. And we all know that it is impossible to be perfect. And so in a sense, that's certain failure. And if we see it as such a, a broader horizon, a broader educational landscape that schools should be doing uh, to provide for our young people and help them towards happy and successful lives. So what about my beginnings? Uh, I am the only person I know whose parents could not pronounce each other's first names. <laughs> uh, my father's first language was Welsh, um, and he was the fourth of five children. And uh, there were some good points, but he had a pretty unhappy and pressured childhood. And my mother's first language was German. And she had a rather idyllic and very happy childhood, until that is, she was 13, when um, the country had to flee their beloved Germany because they were Jews, not by religion, but by heritage. Uh, and from that moment on, the family never again uh, uh, lived together. So her father was a lawyer in Germany and he couldn't believe that his own country was turning against him. And um, he spent a lot of time helping his fellow Jews right up until 1938 when he was swimming in the sea with his family and he had a heart attack and my mother pulled him out of the water but he died. He was in his early 40s and it was only then that they escaped from Germany and came over to England. And uh, as I say, they never lived together again. The older two siblings were interned on the Isle of Man, not trusted by Britain or Germany. And uh, my mother and her brother were billeted with strangers, separately, away from each other. I think she lived in six different families during that period. My mother is extremely pragmatic about it all. Um, indeed, so much so that when my youngest son was seven, he was studying World War II at school. And uh, he was talking to her in the kitchen one day, and he came running into the room and he said, Nanny saw Hitler, and my father and I said, they don't be ridiculous, they must have misunderstood, no, she hasn't. Well, of course she had, but she'd never thought to mention it. Hitler had come, you can you believe it? Hitler had come um, to their school, and their daughter stood out, outside the school and had to, um, had, to, had to stand to attention for him, and they'd hidden the Jewish ones at the back, but she had indeed seen Hitler. But she, uh, to this day, is very positive about her experiences and sees herself as having been very fortunate. My father did not weather the ups and downs in his life anywhere near as well. If you look on as an outsider, he was extremely successful. He uh, won a scholarship to a highly academic school. He um, went into medicine. He won endless prizes. He came, um, went to the top of his profession, ran a research unit. He was part of a team that invented the first radio pill, so you could see inside the um, gastrointestinal tracts, and uh, you know, lengthened all sorts of people's lives and did amazing things. But actually, he felt totally unworthy. He suffered at the hands of a harsh father who thought that coming second was not good enough, and um, he found that really difficult. He ran a hospital in tents in India in the war um, and was devastated by the consequences of war. And he died in 2003. And I, to this day, am ridiculously grateful that he died a few days before the announcement that this country um, went to war with Iraq, pertinent for today, um, because he would have been so upset at that, at that announcement. Uh, he and I adored one another. He didn't want to have children because he was afraid that they might uh, suffer as he had, but my mother eventually persuaded him. And um, some embarrassing photos there. Uh, and uh, he and I adored one another, and I, all I ever wanted really was to make him uh, happier. And I'm sure, in a sense, maybe I did that a little bit. But all the success in the world doesn't make up uh, for feeling unhappy and how you feel about yourself. 
And our beginnings just have such an enormous uh, impact on us. Uh, so being a parent, as we know and heard in our previous speaker, is, it's the most wonderful thing. But I would like to suggest that all parents here will agree it's also the most difficult thing that we ever do in our lives to support and guide our offspring whilst not imposing too much of ourselves onto them, not making unrealistic demands and not um, passing our anxieties onto them is incredibly difficult. Uh, this is a picture of my eldest son with his son as he learns parenting. That's one way of doing it. Um, so, so um, uh, yeah. So, so parenting is such a difficult thing. Looking from the looking from the other angle and, and, and talking about our beginnings. So back to our beginnings then. And this wonderful thing that we all come from a unique beginning. We all have our own life story. And it is um, just at the heart, really, of what schools should be doing to provide an environment which enables us to, to go from our unique beginnings through our life story, working out who we are and enabling our young people to become who they want to become. Each, for each one of us, it's such a different thing. Research has shown a lot about how different people react to similar situations in such different ways. But what can we do is my question uh, it, it, for us all, and mostly for me. What can we do to do the very best we can in schools to make sure that we're giving them the best possible life chances? And by that, I don't mean to do amazingly in exams. Of course. We want them to do their very, very best in exams, that's vitally important. But that's such a tiny bit of lifelong learning and there's so much more that we should be doing. And we should be providing that environment that allows them, each one of them, to emerge as the hero of their own life story. What a privilege it is to be a part of that. Thank you.